But uh, the main ideas were that the first step towards world unity or unity of mankind would follow the same course as the formation of nation unit. The same stages through which the formation of nation has to pass might also come in the way of formation of unity of mankind. And one of the things which we noticed in the formation of nation unit was the centralizing of the national consciousness by rise of monarchy, absolute power, somebody who centralizes the whole consciousness of the rising race and puts a central authority into operation. It looks as if it is refusal or denial of democracy and for individual right. But through it the nation has to pass to attain that unity which we saw illustrated in the life of Louis XIV or some of the monarchs in England, some of the you know, rise of the individuals or oligarchy that comes to the top and organizes and puts into operation a central authority in the evolution of the nation unit. That phase, the evolution of mankind and its unity might have to pass. He says uh, the same Paris process would be there because you know, the difficulties are, as we saw yesterday, loose masses of men and vague forces at work and a lot of material which is of almost, you know, vast dimensions, that is one, and uh, the, because democratic socialism has come to the front and uh, so interest and uh, you know, group interests are trying to also find place in the arrangement of, of new organizations. The politician is there with his uh, only drive of interest rather than, you know, dictation of any thought or principle. You see, his average intelligence, as we saw yesterday, and what he's moved by is more or less economic interest or political interest, party interest, rather than an ideology or a thought or an idealism or some conception of social, well, uh, perfection. Rather, he is rather interested in, you know, interest. It is, he is afraid of change. In fact, he wants status quo very often. He doesn't want to, to, to bring about a change, possibly afraid of uh, losing his place, you see, the next election or votes, and he likes to see that he comes back and he li likes to continue as things as done. And there is a fourth factor which he counted was the moral collapse, collapse of the well, values of life by the two world wars, uh, which have upset the whole, you know, uh, value scale of man's individual scale and the collective scale. That has been also a thing which has been making some kind of international system, international organization almost becoming inevitable on account of uh, the, the, the three or four forces which we counted, you see. And uh, there he, he pointed out one quotation which I might repeat is, once this process of inevitable unification begins, it will be impossible for mankind to draw back and whatever difficulties, disappointments, struggles and reactions check, brutal interruptions might mark the course of its development, well, they would be bound to help in the inevitable result. This is one prophecy which he gave, reading which he gave, not prophecy, reading which he gave 40 years back. So you can understand how the inevitability is working in the form of the UNO organization which subsequently came into operation into existence. And he also put this categorically in the writing, war can be abolished only if national armies are abolished. That was the sentence I gave yesterday also to both. Now, yes, the awakening must go deeper in order that this might be accomplished and lay hold upon much purer roots of action before the psychology of nations will be transmuted into that something which is wondrous, rich and strange, which will eliminate war from human life. Well, that factor has to be awakened. And we saw that that factor, one of the things to be eliminated is national egoism, which is corollary of what is called patriotism, you see. Unless and until that is um, abviated in some way or other, sublimated, changed or limited, sovereignty of nation has already re has had to accept a limitation of sovereignty. Nations have got now 
Well, the sovereignty of nation is practically compromised now. It is much more reduced in its claims and in its actual operation than it was before. And that sentence which I gave yesterday was, wherever egoism is the root of action, it must bear its own proper results and reactions. And however minimized and kept down they may be by an external machinery, their eventual outburst is sure and can only be delayed but not prevented forever. And national egoism would be therefore in for trouble if it insists and comes in the way of the realization of unity of mankind. It will have its own reactions, but it, is, it cannot avoid it by simply saying, oh, we have a machinery, administrative machinery or a political machinery which will not have reactions. Well, it may do it for some time, but it is bound to come. And the stumbling block would be national egoism. That's what we were last time. Now he is telling that how will this work out? This inevitability of unity of mankind, how is it going to work out? He says we can speculate. We can make a speculation, possibility of, you know, the line of evolution maybe. And we say it on the basis of the forces that are at play already. If you make a speculation, the first thing that strikes us is that the ideal basis for such a unification of mankind is the association of free nations. That seems to be the ideal basis. That nations should come together voluntarily. On a, free nations should associate on a basis of voluntary coming together for carrying out some common ideas, purposes, principles or programs. Because, why do we say it is ideal basis? Because in, the, in this free association of nations, the nationalism and internationalism are reconciled. Because when a nation comes freely to join, it is, you see, the, the national element is retained and in international. So there is a sort of reconciliation between internationalism and nationalism. A free federation or free association of nations as a solution of, well, the problem pressing now before mankind is uh, ideal in the sense that double interest, the nation and the international, two interests are reconciled in the conception of free association or free federation, that is one. And um, as in ideal society, if you take an ideal group, what do we call an ideal group? It respects the liberty of the individual, isn't it? If it does not, it does not become a, a very good society or a happy society or a society which you can look upon as perfect. Well, as in society or social group, there is respect for the individual, his liberty, allowing it to have free growth, you see, in a, in a group life. This free growth and his liberty must be in harmony with the need or with the efficiency and solidarity of the whole. But, but a society or a group that is well organized or claims to be efficient, well, it looks to it that the individual liberty is maintained. Free growth of the individual in harmony with the need, efficiency and solidarity of the group life, with the growth of the corporate being also, is maintained. So in this human unity or unity of mankind, this association that would come into being would respect the freedom of the nation. You understand the point? Yes. The freedom of the nation and its growth in conformity or in harmony with the, with the total growth of the whole race, the whole unity of mankind, the, the whole unit. It would see to it that human unity is, uh, is also progressing side by side with the growth of the nation unit. National liberty and free national growth and a self-realization in harmony with the growth and perfection of the whole human race would then be a major principle or major idea would find, which would find a central place in such an organization. A free association would have that central drive to respect the freedom and the growth in harmony with the perfection, solidarity and growth of the race. Well, that would be its main guiding principle. 
But it doesn't mean that there will be no troubles, and there will be enough troubles, he says. And immediately, there will be any tr enough troubles from the immediate you know, powers that are in, in charge of things and so on. As I told you, when that was a very important distinction which you should always bear in mind, the distinction between the state and the nation. That we have made clear, and I don't want to go back upon that ground again, you see. Then the trouble would be from the administrative and the and the, and the state side of the nation. You see, it's not the, the nation, the, the state that is the organized expression of the vital economic, military, and administrative life of the collective nation. Well, it is that which is very often the embodiment, not of the soul of the race, the psychological entity of the collectivity, but of its vital interests, its ambition, its selfishness, and its pride, and its all kinds of you know uh, things which create difficulty. Psychological. It is that. It, does, it is not merely administrative and outer, it is psychological. And psychologically because the administration doesn't represent the best of the, of the, of the consciousness of the race, of the nation. It is, it is, it is, it is only efficient but doesn't represent the, the soul, you see. And that we have already done. Only sometimes is it that it is this trouble would be there by powers that are in charge of administrations in nations. And it is not reason and moral principles and justice that act there, because there they are held as secondary. In the, in the movement of politics today, international politics, national politics, it is, it is what it is, it's right. It's not reason, moral principles and justice that act. They are only secondary for, and it's only power, force, interest, well, the, the possible pressure that you can exert without coming to physical or material clash, you see, all kinds of, uh, you know, subterfuges which hide the pressure of force under many guards, you see. So, it is that which is one obstacle, he said. And uh, it is only very rarely and sometimes that ideas leap out as armed forces. That is when the human spirit is driven to the wall, you see. It is then that armed ideas come. I told you yesterday, I think, who was, somebody was putting idea in the question time. And I said that, yes, ideas don't seem to be only, you know, floating in the air. Uh, it is wrong for people to think that ideas have no relation to life. And uh, because uh, man has got to grow in the capacity to do better than he does now. And uh, this work of trying to do the nation's work is now in the hands of governments, in the hands of the state. And they yield to pressure and not to principles. You see, so, this last two wars, particularly the last one, has brought into relief this great fact that it is the great powers that really count in the international scale. This is a very great fact which was brought out prominently. That in any international situation, the decision, the power to weigh the scale depends upon well, the great powers. And that really count in international scale. Their voice and their power is, is decisive. Those smaller nations have their rights or can have their rights. They have a right to say, to feel, to, to declare and so on. But the power to decide, you see, is, is something in the hands of the great powers. And uh, this was one of the theses which I worked upon, I mean, worked out in the Makerer College in Kampala, 1953. That if the psychological factors necessary for evolution or bringing into actual existence unity of mankind had to be really emphasized and brought into light by present conditions obtaining, then there are several methods by which the desired goal could be brought near. One of the things I refer to was mm. The necessity of, uh, one can see that when the UNO was brought into existence, the five nations that had fought and paid the price of winning the war might have thought themselves justified, and I think even everybody might have agreed with them, that if they allowed equal vote in the Security Council and in the organization which they were bringing about, they can be outvoted. 
If you bring into an existence an organization in which all are equal and you are a minority, then they would be outvoted. So they had the necessity of reserving the veto. This is an understandable position. They had to reserve the veto in order to see that uh, uh, maintenance of international peace by trying to meet and understand and trying to minimize conflicts and trying to understand the other man's point of view and being tolerance and uh, trying to see how far you can adjust differences and conflicts and so on. Well, trying to into bringing that into organization, if they thought that if there are 55 nations and there were only five, there's every chance of them being outvoted in a, in a constitution which all are equal. That's why perhaps the reservation of the right was at that time a necessity. But five years of experience, seven years of experience should have taught them that veto is a, something which militates against the very central principle of equality of nations. In the UNO, nations must be absolutely equally respective of their size and power. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make any sense much. After five or seven years, somebody England might be America or some nation should have reason to that. That is really bringing into existence and play the true psychological factor which bring a solid unity into existence because that would be real. This is administrative necessity, fear, convenience, compromise, economic uh, idea of, well, you can call it enlightened interest. It is that which is keeping it. It is good that something is keeping it alive. I don't, don't say it is bad. It is quite very good and indispensable. It is the one hope. But then if you want to make it living, not merely a, a constitution made of red tape or rules in which everybody sees how far it conforms to such and such a law or such and such a you know article, but goes there to see how far he has made alive the unity of mankind and how far he is himself contributing to that unity, then all the who go there must go there with a sense of meeting family members. The least that they can do is to feel that there is a family and we have to look after a family and every member of the family is equal. Because a brother is weak or small, it doesn't mean that he has no right. His right is equal. You have a right to even prevent him by force if you think that he is going wrong. But that force must be the force evoked by the collectivity, not by people interested in maintaining their political, economic or other interests. Yes, it must be absolutely in the interest of unity of mankind. Because force would be, as he said, in the nation itself. You have to maintain a force to maintain law and order, isn't it? How is a peace and order maintained in the nation? By maintaining a police force, is it not? I mean, you have to keep, you can't completely, you know, get out of the necessity so long as man is what he is. How more than half animal, I mean, more than half moved by his animal propensities. You have to have a force so as to keep the antisocial or, or animal, you know, instinct in man from operating. So, as, as, as in the nation, the law and order is kept by Maintaining a force which would put down either individual insolence or individual, you know, uh, breaking of unity or a, a group trying to, to smash the, 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 the harmony and, the, and the, the solidarity of the whole. A group can arise. It, it is very often that is a small group has always gone to power that way by organizing itself. And I give you the instance of Nazi Germany that uh, or Italy for the matter of that. The, the, all the Italians were not uh, fascists, not at all, for hardly 10%. Uh, this is, so it is a small minority which organizes and goes to, uh, to, to, you know, to the seat of power by, by simply that organization. Well, nation keeps the armed forces in the form of police force or a little military force in order to keep law and order. Well, the same thing will have to be done in the international order of some kind. Because uh, all the nations would not be equally evolved and uh, they, they would be not moved by the very highest, uh, you know, impulses in their own psychology. They would be moved by selfishness or greed or, you know, some sort of ambition or motives which are, which are, you know, I mean, of the lower side of human nature. Now, what has brought this into relief? And people say that the terms, yes, UNO gives equal status and so on. I have just told you that the veto should have been voluntarily given up by some great nation. That would have brought in the true psychological element into play. 
that would have shown that they are genuine about the thing about bringing unity. Oh yes, they, they don't want to have any special right. If all are equal and want to want to treat uh, each, each other as equals, well, here is our veto. And if one power had done that, I think he would have contributed more than 10 or 20 resolutions of the UNO to maintain peace. Because that is really bringing the psychological element into play. The true thing, I mean, the true unity is there. And Sri Aurobindo's sentence I must quote because it is very beautiful sentence written about as I told you 40 years ago. He says, they forget, uh, you see, that uh, you, uh, great powers have rights, he says, you see, and uh, constitutions can only disguise facts, they cannot abrogate them. You say, no, our constitution is like that, but constitution can disguise a fact, it can't abrogate the fact, it can't get out of it. It is possible that war may go, but then, he says, there is some chance of, some so, sort of coercion can take its place. War is not the only way in which coercion can take place, so some sort of coercion can take place. Even a war of classes might be possible. A class war. Socialistic government and increasing nationalization of industries will not necessarily remove all causes of conflict. So that is the reading of this possibility of uh, unific some factors which can contribute to the unity. Now this is problem of uniformity and liberty chapter 16. The problem would be as he puts down here that drive to unity is the dominant drift of nature today. There is a drive which you feel all along, you see. And uh, this was foreshadowed in world history. In the past 50 years one could see that the drive was towards unity. And as we said, ideal form is a free federation or, or you know, equal association of nations. And therefore he says, the question arises in our mind is, Will this unity of mankind, when achieved, will it become oppressive? That's one. Well, because that happens when power is centralized now, because it is not in full vigorous psychological existence or vital control, and we don't see it in its full strength. But uh, you see, but yes, the whole of it, when it is achieved, well, will it become oppressive? And will it suppress liberty? of nations. On that ground, there is a lot of trouble in Congo and other places, you see. It is on that possible ground. It is not even full use of the force, but whatever little force is available to you, and it has tried to, to use. And those people have not outgrown the tribal consciousness. They have not reached the nation consciousness yet. So the tribal rival, rivalries and collective antagonisms are at work. And it is very difficult for them to rise to that uh, vision of national consciousness you know, in their own working. So in this uh, difficulty of tribal consciousness and the clash of them, the imposition of force of UNO to maintain peace brought into play all opposition of the UNO in a concentrated form. All opposition of the nations that are members of the UNO, remember. Belgium, England, every imperial power, every imperial power, whatever opposition it had, you know, subconsciously kept down because the UNO was there and they couldn't openly say, we don't want to belong to it, but they wanted to take full advantage of it also in one sense, by avoiding a war and by, by participating in whatever was possible to come together by unity, economical basis and so on. But there was plenty of opposition. It is that opposition that has found an opportunity to concentrate all its power and there to, to frustrate you, you know. It is not at all to bring into existence the nationhood of the of the Africans. That is clear as daylight to anyone who can see through. You see? It is not at all to protect the liberty and freedom of these tribes, but it is only to foil the effort of you and know, to maintain a authority in the world where, you know, it can well the, all the opposition of the of the imperialist and colonial powers has concentrated itself there. And it is that which is the difficulty in Congo, not interference of UNO in the free development of Congo nationhood. Not at all. I don't believe it. 
because the UN would have to withdraw immediately, peace was restored. I don't know now two months, I have not read the papers, you know, and I'm not up to date, I'm sorry. But um, <laughs> I heard that in Laos they arrived at some kind of agreement uh, of trying to remain neutral in, in Laos. Just yesterday night when you brought the paper, that's the line I saw. That in the Laos they have signed an agreement at Geneva or somewhere uh, to, to keep it neutral and keep out of it perhaps. Well, now... <coughs> Second is, will it suppress liberty or will it end in Europeanizing the whole world? Because there is a dominant note, a dominant culture. All countries of the world are not yet free. Let us remember the great fact also that there are countries in the world who are not free yet. And Shirondo says, now I am quoting a sentence, assertion of his human dignity and assertion of his freedom is a virtue which man has only acquired by long evolution and painful endeavor. To respect the freedom of others, he is still less naturally prone, though without it his own liberty can never be really secure. But he uh, is. Yes. To dominate and to oppress are his inborn animal propensities. <laughs> so this is the difficulty. You see, so once the power is there, the desire or impulse would be to try to dominate and to suppress and so on. When unification comes, the idea is a necessity will be that the principle of order, therefore of uniformity, will be a natural tendency. You see, when the organization has come to to its own, so to say, the tendency will be to the principle of order in trying to bring into existence uniformity, impose uniformity. And this will be opposed by the necessity of principle, maintaining principle of liberty. You see, the freedom and, uh, and uniformity, this will be the point of difficulty and difference. As we see already, individual liberty seems to be destined to eclipse under state socialism. Even today, the individual's liberty seems to be not, not uh, capable of being maintained because the state socialism is taking away plenty of liberty even in free countries like India. Well, so individual liberty is not, not allowed to, to go beyond such limit. And because they think what is uh, there are the state's idea of social justice, you see, and uh, the state's idea of doing something which they think that uh, the individual, if he left alone, then he would pursue his own ambition to such an extent as to well uh, bring about a collective life which would do gross injustice to vast masses of mankind, and it's not a fear without basis in one sense. So that uh, you see, uh, it's a. As individual liberty seems almost destined to eclipse under social state socialism, well, will not the similar thing happen to the nation unit and the international life? How will nationality be affected in the new unification of mankind? That is one question. And how far is this uniformity necessary? Would it necessarily involve the solution of the national consciousness? But we know that the law of life is to, to aggregate. Life uh, tends not to isolate, but to, to come together, interchange, exchange, mutuality, you know, um, uh, relationship. And the law of life is therefore formation of group. Group formation is there. Humanity must have therefore group. You cannot, uh, this law will, will be more ma mightier than the need of uniformity, e existence and maintenance of groups of humanity. Well, that, that would be necessary. And unity of mankind should not be governed by political and administrative motives. Then only it will tend to militate against the liberty of the, of the nations. It will be uniformity of culture, if you like. Only the difference being perhaps of the language and, uh, and the evolution under certain special condition of history through which the, the, the culture has evolved, there will be differences, variations as he calls it, you see. But uh, it would be a uniformity of culture 
the only difference for us being of the language and uh, they might remain as a necessary variation in the play of the unity. The fear is that the science and socialism would tend more and more to regiment men because it would be very easy with the scientific instruments now to impose that sort of regimentation on vast masses. We need not have large number of persons in order to coerce vast masses who are not equally equipped as yourselves. This factor is to be borne in mind. And that brings us to the problem of law and liberty. You see, nature's law is when she attains progress along a line, if you watch, it is unity in diversity. If you, you know, progressive evolution of the vegetable kingdom or the insect kingdom or any movement of nature, if you observe, the, the law that nature works upon when she progresses towards the goal is unity in diversity. Constantly nature is changing, evolving and ascending. It is changing. It is not as if constant change, therefore some schools of thought always tell us that there is nothing stable. That, that is not true. There is an evolution. On, uh, you see, the new thing that is brought into existence is an order. As Tennyson put it, the old order changes, giving place to new, but new is order. So that if there is an organization at work, and there is a, seems to be almost a purpose. You see, it's not merely change because uh, unlimited, uninterrupted, meaningless, significance, less change. It is not that. The change is, change is significant. And therefore, we have to give it the name evolution. Yes. Evolution, uh, therefore, uh, uh, seeing behind the change, this constant basis which is evolving, a, a purpose that seems to be working out. Now here he is saying that nature is changing, evolving, ascending. In the lower kingdom where we see nature at work, we don't see presence of knowledge, consciousness. There we, and still there is, there is unity in diversity. There is change, evolution and ascent. But there is no odd error and deformation in the lower nature. When knowledge is absent, error also is reduced to the minimum. Deformation is not, not also present. Well, man has now got mind and will and has evolved into a conscious being. He can therefore react upon nature. He and even when he reacts upon nature, we shouldn't forget that man's mind also is a part of nature. Man's mind is not, not something outside nature, it's a part of nature. Its nature becomes self-conscious, really speaking. Its nature becomes self-conscious. Mind is nature that has become self-conscious, at least partly. And it is inspired with a conscious will, this mind, which is a self-conscious part of nature, nature itself becomes self-conscious. It is inspired with a will to impose a higher and higher law on her own process of life. Now look at, you see, it is as mother said in that uh, sentence, you see, the serpent uh, is biting its, biting its tail. Well, in one sense, nature evolving mind, mind, nature. And that is now charged with a conscious will to impose upon yes, a higher and higher law in her own process of life. Yeah, that's it. In the lower creation, there is no mental conflict as there is in man. Because there is conscious evolution now. This mind, nature become conscious is... is is compelled to, to evolve and to impose a, a higher law, higher and higher law of life upon its own process of life. And then there is conflict because there is already operating a lower law. 
law of the animal life, law of interest, law of desire, law of impulse, law of passion. You see, so law of mere emotion, law of mere idea, partial thought or partial idea masquerading or passing off in human mind as whole truth and so on. There are plenty of things which create conflict in the mind because between the two strata of life, the lower life and the higher life, there is a rung of the lower and rung of the higher. And on each plane or each strata, there is infinite chance of conflict in the mind of man. But man has the chance because he can exceed himself. And this evolution is now through the conflict between the lower and the higher. Man fixes the law by his mind on his life. By mind, man fixes a law. Oh, law of forces, law of facts, law of behavior, law of politics, law of society, law of economics, any. This is mind. He notices what is actual condition, the facts. He studies, knows, notes. He comes to conclusion by studying facts and notices. And then he tries to foresee which line life should take. On the basis of what he knows, what he studies and what is. He tries to foresee what should be, and uh, he tries to foresee what ought to be or should be. And then he, he puts a law. But nature is full of evolutionary drive, and nature has infinite potentialities within her, and tries to realize this potentiality in her progress. And therefore what we should bear in mind is, that no law arrived at by mind is eternal. Because it is progressive, it must change. Nature is not going to listen to the law of the mind. Yes, mind has to impose some law for 50 years, 30 years, 100 years, like that. It is because mind is trying to work on what is and trying to prognosticate or to see what ought to be, what should be, what is desirable, what is best or what must be. And then it makes a rule for that. And this is changing, this is, there is no fixed absolute law, you see, this is not eternal. And this is very difficult for man to act upon and to admit even. You go to any man who has a scheme or idea and he will simply tell you that uh, this, is, this is the last word. He has to know that this is temporary and this has to pass, you see. And uh, this is just now, yes, we can't do better, so we are trying to do this, but there is nothing fixed like that, because mind cannot. It's not the, not the fault of mind at all, but mind can't do more than what it's doing. But it is better to bear that in mind. Ideas and ideals are very often regarded as, as if they had nothing to do with life. There are many people, 8 out of 10, or even 9 out of 10, tell people who have got ideals and ideas, you are a dreamer, you don't know, you don't know idea what is life, you don't know. Actuality, we are dealing with life. You are dealing with ideas, so that uh, we are living on the earth and you are living in the clouds, something like that, they want to imply when they say you know, to the idealists or to the ideas that uh, you have no relation with life. They forget that it is their attachment to the present constitution of life which makes them think so. It is not that they know life better than the man who has ideas and ideas, certainly not. On the contrary, perhaps the man who has ideas and ideas knows life far better because he knows the deepest instinct and inspiration of life. He knows perhaps the forces that are really at the bottom of life. And those who are subject to the present movement of life are perhaps a plaything of the impulses and, and, and movements of desire and ambition. Most probably they are unconscious instrument of perpetuation of ignorance. 99 out of 100, it is that. It is desire to continue life in its present half-animal mold which makes them feel that nothing greater is possible. And this idea that practical, you see, they used to tell us, I remember very well when I was young, you see, oh, you are not practical, they would say. And they didn't know that that is the highest practicality possible to life. This practicality is submission to half-animal animal existence. What people call practical is a round, a groove which they have, you know, made and into which they want to move constantly. 
They might enlarge the groove, but not the plane on which the groove is moving. It is, it is the most, uh, you know, tragic view that a man who wants life to grow to a higher, you know, value, uh, sees when he sees this opposition of, of life itself to its own emancipation, to its own greater realization, to the possibility of, uh, you know, bringing into life itself something far greater than what is. Now, this, uh, in this chapter 17, he is saying that this idea and I regarding of idea and ideals as if they, had, they were idle dreams and abstractions and as if they had nothing to do with life is the greatest mistake which human beings are committing, mind is committing. People actually say that life is practical and uh, they say that this, the actual is, is the only thing that can, you know, that should be accepted immediate and the present, and then Shirondo adds, but ideas and ideals are only expressions of life. Where do the ideas come from? They are the expressions of life. And they are trying to find a higher law and raise life to a higher potentiality. That is the utility of ideas and ideals to life itself. In fact, they are results of life. They are the, they are actually the, the impulses of life itself coming to to try to see first convincing mind and trying to raise the whole plane of life to the to the plane of the ideal. And this life itself trying to raise. In the subhuman creation, nature lives subconsciously, and when man has passed his present limit of consciousness and risen to the superhuman or supra rational consciousness which is potential to him, while nature in him would live and act consciously. Man would not be unconscious as he is now. She is moving unhasting, unresting, is from his writing, you see. She is moving unhasting, unresting to the inherent and therefore predestined aim of her evolution, you see. Social evolution of human race takes place by the action of relation between three factors. One is the individuals, second is communities, third is mankind. The collective social evolution of man takes place under the action or relations that are established or are current between individuals, collectivities and mankind. Between the three, there is the weaving of the web of social existence of man. Each is separate and yet related. The individual is separate but related to community. Community is separate but related to mankind. The individual is not directly but is also related to mankind. So each is separate and yet related. Mankind has no organized life. The relation of the individual man to mankind is through the parts, through the whole, through the aggregates. Because we see genus, species and individual. That is the collective life organizes itself all through the rung of universal nature as genus, species and individuals. So the genus is on the top, species is second, various species making up the genus and in each species individual. And uh, instead now, the difficulty at present, in the present situation is that instead of interchange between these three factors that are uh, the real factors that take part in social evolution of mankind, instead of interchange there is struggle, conflict. And to cure disorder, for instance, or to cure strife, what society or individual or Collectivity does is to resort to removing freedom. To get rid of separation, it tries to remove diversity. But freedom is as necessary as law and diversity as necessary as unity. For absolute uniformity would be cessation of life. Freedom is as necessary as law and diversity as necessary as unity. Absolute uniformity would be cessation of life. Life wants diversity. It is reason that wants to impose uniformity. 
his mind that he wants to impose uniformity. Nature aims at true unity because she wants throughout to work on the base of unity by supporting diversity. Nature does not diversity in her manifestations, in her actions. Variation is necessary to the organism and variation, the same variation necessary to the whole, to the aggregate. As variation is necessary in, in the species, it is necessary also in the aggregate, in the group. Harmony between unity and diversity is the secret of life. Unity and diversity. And if you observe, he says, nature impels from within. It does not impose from without, from outside. Nature imposes this harmony between unity and diversity from inside, from within. It does not impose from outside. Liberty stands upon this law. The principle of liberty stands upon this inner constitution in which nature itself maintains unity and diversity, harmony between unity and diversity. That is the real basis of freedom or liberty. And then I give a quotation from his book. By liberty we mean the freedom to obey the law of our being. Freedom to obey the law of our being. To grow to our natural self-fulfillment. To grow to our natural self-fulfillment. To find out naturally and freely, find out naturally and freely, our harmony with our environment. That is liberty. It is said, that uh, to give this kind of liberty is dangerous. People say, if you give freedom like that, liberty will mean freedom to obey the law of our inner being and to grow to our natural self-fulfillment and find naturally and freely our harmony with the environment. This would be, man would say, I don't want any harmony with the environment. Or he say, my growth is like this and I will, I will do just what I like. He might not, he might claim license and like kind of, a, you know, a behavior without any, an insolent behavior. It is said this is dangerous. Well, Sir says, and I quote his sentence, that if a real and a spiritual and psychological unity were effectuated, liberty would have no perils and disadvantages. If real and spiritual unity were effectuated, Liberty would have no peril and disadvantages. It is on this basis that education at Pondicherry is founded. Such a freedom that uh, some educations were staggered at the amount, at the way in which it was carried. Couldn't believe. And they find it was, it was 13 years now. Children have absolute freedom in the unimaginable outside Pondicherry. And I would think that perhaps it would be very easy outside to try. But it is there. <laughs> it is on this that if a real and spiritual unity is effectuated, then you have full liberty. There is no peril. Because the unity that is behind will be the controlling, you know, it will be the guiding force. And that unity is, is the unity of the spirit, a divine entity, a divine spark. And it will not allow things to go too far in divergence. There is no peril and no disadvantages. Without free growth of others, those people who do not give free growth to others, they would not feel themselves entirely free. <laughs> there is some freedom, <laughs> bonded inside which makes them feel to impose free, want a freedom to other people. Imposed law would be only be mechanical. A law when it is imposed from outside would only act mechanical. And then he says in his one of his declarations, so to say, human society progresses really and vitally in proportion as a law becomes a child of freedom. Human society progresses really and vitally in proportion as law becomes a child of freedom. 
it will reach its perfection, social progress, when man having learned to know and become spiritually one with his fellow man, the spontaneous power of his society exists only as an outward mold of his self-governed inner liberty. Society comes into existence as an outer mold of his inner liberty because of the unity with others. Well, that would be reaching the, the point at which uh, it would be reaching its perfection. But progress would be in proportion as law becomes child of freedom. Well, I think we stop there because if I begin the next chapter, then we will not have time to finish it. Is that the end of chapter 17? Yeah, uh, I think so, yes, 17. Yes, that's the end of chapter 17. We begin with this inner realization. Yes, that's it. That's the first thing. Each individual. Yes, each there. individual. And so when the happens. individual has found his inner truth, he will find that, that truth in others. And then those who have felt, seen or make an effort to reach this inner truth, automatically will come together. That's how a nucleus is formed of the higher values of life. In a class that is not in conformity with the current economic or political or administrative values of life, if it is to be brought actually into existence, it can only be by an individual taking the initiative. Because as we saw, group is always conservative. And it is wedded to current values. Not only that, it, the current values try to acquire dictatorial power, almost trying to drive you to the corner if they can. If you have the guts and if you can stand, then you have your chance of creating some new values. Otherwise, otherwise, what happens to many people who have very good potentialities of a higher, uh, you know, value of life or rise to a higher, you know, rung of uh, possibility of ideal or idea, they have no chance because the, the, the current, uh, you know, social force is so much centered around you know, external and economic and desire soul of man that it is impossible for an ordinary man to resist that pressure, you see. But uh, some people who have this inner formation or inner urge or inner call or aspiration, well, for him first is to, to live it himself, irrespective of what is outside. And when he has tried to live it, he will find that there are kindred spirits who are also trying to live the same thing. And it is then they come together, you see. Then that higher value for which they stand finds a chance of well, finding a nucleus, finding a group life. Well, and the law of this earth consciousness is that nothing becomes permanent here unless it becomes a part of collective life. An extraordinary or supreme individual can rise to any height. That will, will indicate a possibility. But it will not become the governing law of life till it embodies itself in a collectivity. Because individual, collectivity and the, you see, that is our metaphysical stand, if you remember. You remember the stand is yeah, the individual, the universal and the transcendent. Well, that is the, the, the three positions or a triple aspect of the omnipresent reality. And therefore, or for the earth here on this globe, well, matter is a governing law is a governing force. And if a thing is not established in matter, it has no chance of lasting. And to get the thing established in matter, it must take group existence. You see, unless it becomes, uh, you see now, for instance, take mind, intellectuality. A man from uh, in Africa has no developed intellectuality. But he has all the the potentiality present put in matter, the very brain. You see, there is an instrument ready there. And so the moment you take an African out of his surrounding and train him for 10, 15 or 10 years, well, his intellect is there equal to anybody's intellect afterwards if he's clever. I mean, if he works hard at it and brings out, he will find that mind is there. There was no mind 20 years back. It was living half animal life or half vital life and living just uh, primitive in the sense of only physical needs and, you know, impulses of the vital and so on. Well, suddenly he, now he finds that mind is there for him. In the same way, any high ideal, a divine spirit, 
which is the basis of all existence. If the human being finds it and concretely realizes that experience, now if that experience has to become the property of man as an evolving animal, it must be established in matter. And if you cannot establish in matter, till you make it a property of collective life. An individual doing would be an exception, would not change the law. The problem is to change the law that is here at work. The law confines man to his present formula of mind, life and body. An individual doing would be an exception, would not change the law. The problem is to change the law that is here at work. The law confines man to his present formula of mind, life and body. Human being is constrained to remain limited to the mental, vital and physical consciousness. If there is a wider, higher spiritual and divine consciousness in him, and if that has to become a dynamic movement or law of his life, it must establish itself first in the individual, then in the group. Then it will become a constantly, you know, operative force in the process of evolution. It will not change all the earth at once. It's not a miracle. But it will be a constant factor working for the higher evolution of the whole race. Because the potentiality of mind is overpassed. A self-exceeding has taken place not in an individual but in a group. It is a group that establishes the law in, in, in terms of matter. Uh, is it, um, how would you relate the uh, reaction of the uh, Indian um, national uh, natives in South America? Uh, they have the vitality that the African has. Is it because of the vitality that when you take the African out and educate him, he comes back and it becomes uh, a factor in the nation, but the ones in South America seem to be uh, less um, response South America? To, yes. The Indian oh. uh, Navy population down there. Mm -hmm. Is this, uh, is, uh, is this uh, an observation that has sense or not? I don't think that there is any relevance. First, because those people who went there were the Spaniards, is it not? Well, but there were some Incas or some Navy people No, there. but no, no. Those who went from outside yeah. carrying the more modern civilization were the Spaniards. Yeah. Well, with due deference to Spaniards as a nation, they are semi-orientals. And they are wedded to, to a way of, uh, you know, life, which they themselves are not risen fully to the intellectual or mental level. Without any disrespect to great Spaniards who have written very great things. Yeah. I mean, I don't say, because this is not judging the whole nation. But I am trying to put before you the way in which they went there. Not Spaniards as they evolved a culture and were the top, once at the top of, European culture and conquering the con continent of Europe. I'm not talking of that Spain, but the Spain that went out. Well, what they went out was exploitation. The way they destroyed Inca culture, I tell you, puts them in my mind to a very low level of culture. I, I frankly accept. You find some, some, you can, may not understand it, but you try to know what it is, how it is. Nothing, they, they, they wanted to see nothing. Fanaticism, pure, and uh, love for power at the cruelty, with absolute cruelty. You, you cannot call it by any other name. And that's why they, they couldn't succeed here. They couldn't succeed very well because of that, those factors which themselves, you know, put their life into, into a limitation which was impossible for them to, to overgrow. And the other people succeeded back, back better because they kept their mind open to some extent. They tried to to let other people live also. I mean, you see. So they have not made a serious effort. That is my own feeling. They have not made a serious effort to awaken the intellectuality or mentality in those people. Otherwise, mind is there. I am perfectly sure about it. There is no man who holds a human organism who has not the potentiality of mind. Mind is there. Uh, Sri Parani, these ideas of uh, our being so well, um, from what little I know, uh, it seemed to me to contrast with uh, some of the things which he has said earlier. And I'm wondering if these are a development, if there's really a contrast, or it's my own confusion. But uh, in an earlier essay, he wrote about the unity of India. And there he said that the true unity of India was not in any uh, 
uh, centralization or external unity, but the, India had been great because of the small uh, localized communities which had always allowed this uh, freedom of development and expression. And he looked down upon those uh, great periods of unity, not only in India, but uh, in Europe, where he had had unification by uh, Roman power and other powers. And he looked on those as uh, uh, low parts in a cycle, which represented only a superficial unity rather than a, a true unity or a high level of culture. And now we come, uh, as I understood uh, your comments today, to uh, Arabindo saying that uh, there is a gradual evolution in which we will get this uh, outer uh, political and uh, administrative unity, which earlier he has uh, made fun of as something superficial, right? Uh, you almost feel in some of his earlier writing, at least I felt that, that he would like to see uh, a civilization which always respected these uh, regionalisms and localisms. No, I don't think so. I'll answer it now fully. One. One point is that um, this point we have already done, in fact, in the seventh and eighth and sixth, seventh and eighth chapter, where he referred to this small rise of Republican cities in Greece time and in India and in Egypt and other places, and he showed that they were more alive because the smallness of size allowed them each one to participate. You remember that we have done that portion yes. two days back. Only we finished that that part. Is you see, you should particularly if you are interested, go through his whole book of ideal of human unity, and go through it a little carefully. Ideal of human unity was written about forty years ago, after the political period through which he had lived. So, even when he lived in the political period, there is a distinct note that India's rise is necessary for human unity. I have got passages from his Vande Mataram's days in 1905, 4, 6 and 7, in which clearly and definitely has said that rise of India is not for our own self, only for our own interest and political and economic uplift, but the soul of India and the culture of India that contribution to humanity to make, which she could make if she was free. Well, this was a distinct note. One, and his reading that the small republics have been more creative is borne out by fact. But he therefore never contended that the rise of the bigger units, in fact, he is tracing the evolution of collective life from small units, the family, the tribe, the clan, the, the commune, nation, and he says, humanity, this is a line which is in keeping with his metaphysical and philosophic and yogic outlook, a vision of life in which the fulfillment of man has to work out along two lines of individual divinity and collective realization of unity of one that is all. You see, it is, it is very organically connected with his ideal of life, life divine. Life divine is not an isolated, you know, vision of life in which individual is, is supposed to rise to a divinity. The whole of life of man and including his collective life is also a part of the operation of a cosmic consciousness. And uh, this cosmic consciousness manifests itself in group life. And group life begins with a small individual formation of family and goes on increasing in the process of evolution till it will end in realizing the highest possible unit, the unity of mankind. Well, that is what he wrote about 40 years ago, this book, Ideal of Human Unity. And as it was uh, written 40 years back and the Second World War intervened, we, when we were trying to bring out the second volume, the second edition, we told him that uh, uh, he said that he didn't want to publish the second edition of that. He said that, you see, much has happened afterwards and I would like to change many things which I said in my proposition in the ideal of human unity in the chapters. Then we said that anyhow, uh, what you have written is of some importance, so it is better to publish it. So he added a postscript chapter to this book, Ideal of Human Unity, to bring it after the Second War up to date. That was written in 1949 or 48, the postscript chapter, you see. And in that he made a said so that uh, certain things are there, but here is what I want to say about the present situation. And there you will find very pertinent uh, I mean, reading of the present international situation. And I, I surprised the minister there in New York, this Meta, you know, 
G.L. Mehta, who was India's ambassador here, when he came back to India, we pointed out the passage where he said in 1949 the possibility of Chinese aggression. In the postscript chapter, he has said about the attack on Tibet and uh, you see possibility of Chinese aggression on India. He, for the first time, used the word coexistence for Russia and, and United States in 48, 49. 48, 49, yes. I believe that was the first time that I heard the word anyway from, from him only, coexistence. And he put it down that it is not impossible. Two socialist, social systems working on different principles can coexist to bring to mankind the result of diversity of organization of collective life or social life, and it would be good for mankind. So what I point out to you is two things cycle human cycle and ideal of human unity these two books deal with the growth of collective consciousness and his uh, idea of what uh, political factors and psychological factors operate in it and how he looks at the problem i think that would give you a very more correct picture of his uh, conception of collective life and its perfection you mm -hmm. see the regional as good but at a certain stage of the cycle which would be superseded later. He, he said that uh, the point of weakness of the, weak, uh, the, the small organization we saw. One was that the slaves and women were not free. The second was that, uh, yes, that was one. And the uh, second was that they were weak against uh, you know, other states. Their only policy against other states was war. Athens against Sparta or Thebes against... Uh, they, and therefore they submitted themselves or allowed themselves to be... Uh, narrow in their outlook ultimately. They were very alive for 500 years perhaps. You see, and they could therefore created a live culture because each one, he said, felt a direct part of the whole. And each citizen thought that he was the state and that uh, it was uh, this direct feeling of the whole in him which made him create things uh, so, so rich for human culture. And uh, Greece, India, Certain parts of other countries, they have evolved this thing in small states. And small states have a great efficiency in certain way and great weaknesses also. And the, he, he points out that in this book very well. <laughs> this is why he would never accept any legal code, even a code of honor, as being permanent. No, no. He would like that uh, uh, things must change. Tendency behind the codification is something in nature. That you have to see is psychological. The actual giving voice to it in form of, you know, specific directions is only a secondary result of what is at work. And what you have to do is to direct yourself to the tendency at work in psychology, not in the codification of it in social life by certain people who feel a certain necessity. At a certain time, perhaps somebody said that, uh, uh, you see, uh, no, Samurai had a certain right, or a Brahmin had a certain right, or a Kshatri had a certain way of doing. Well, that was a tendency of the collective life in which the certain aspect of human psychology finds expression, administrative capacity or handling of power. That's all that it stands for ultimately, you see. And uh, it is that which we once remember, and then each man can have all the tendencies in why should there be a class in society. You see, that is what, uh, what has now become bizarre, as they say. And now the technicians are coming round to a position in which they say, perhaps it is better that the technician goes on doing what he has been accustomed to. They, they are feeling, uh, Gerard Hart, for instance, in his book, almost pleads for it, isn't it? Time, sex and, uh, you know, uh, pain, sex and time, Gerard Hart, he is trying to plead for a society in which a classification along some psychological movement would take place. It's, it's very ideal. There are thinkers who think that uh, classification of society is good. Now, whether classification should proceed on an external basis is the point, and Shirondo wouldn't agree that external basis should not be there. Each one has all the potentialities in him. In everyone, there is a Brahmin who wants to know, understand, and uh, a disinterested, you know, intellectual development, and a free dissemination of it is the quality of the Brahmin. Search for truth disinterested and dissemination of whatever truth or, or knowledge he has got without counting the price, without wanting any return. That is a sign of the Brahmin. They exist anywhere, everywhere in the world, people who are devoted to search, you know, without any, whether they gain money or not, and then give it without any, any thinking of return. Well, that is the Brahmin in, in human, human humanity. Well, the man who is uh, interested in 
in administration, in handling power, in, in doing work or in, in necessity of conflict and fighting out a cause. Well, you put him in an administrator or you put him in a military or put him in an organization. Well, he's exatrian. Now, you require this even in business sometimes. You business, uh, that's it. So that a classification of men along that line would be uh, now an artificial imposition. Now, in the present condition, you see. But one has to see how to develop those faculties which are indicated by the past classification because they were real. The tendencies in human nature are real. The tendency to knowledge, tendency to will, act and administer, tendency to, to, to make life rich by interchange, the, 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 the Vaishya tendency, and the tendency to serve, the tendency to, be, to labor, to bring a fine, perfect material form into existence. Well, these are in all men. And everyone requires all the four in him to be perfect. He has written this in a psychological chapter. This is in a psychological book. How the Chaturvarna, Chaturvarna, the four castes, you see the elements of four castes are potential in each man. And if he wants to reach perfection in, in his line, he may dominate. He, his life might be dominated by one. But all the three will be necessary to make him perfect in his line. He says if you take a Brahmin, he must have the quality of the Kshatriya to fight out for his truth, to organize his truth, to bring it down to, to the earth. You see, he must have that. A Kshatriya must have knowledge of, of how to administer, what to do. He must have also the, the interchange with other people. And he must bring down his thing on the, on the plane of matter. So that each one requires all the four. One may lead, but the, all the four are necessary in order to achieve the perfect fulfillment of his psychological impulses or faculties. This is developed in under the other book. That is perhaps in in a human cycle. Some portion is in human cycle. Some part of it is in human cycle, and one portion is in foundations of Indian culture. I would strongly recommend that book to you, but because it was written not as a thesis, but uh, as uh, something that answered the position of, you know, that uh, William Archer, I think. He answered William Archer's attack on Indian culture. So it is of a different nature of writing, whereas these two books are positively putting down his position, uh, you know, with a relation to his metaphysical outlook and to his yogic life, to the vision of a truth that is coming to mankind. He has felt all along that uh, the, the time has come for man to go beyond the formula of intelligence and mind, intellectual or mental consciousness. And a consciousness beyond mind has now to be attained by man, willingly, voluntarily, by his own effort, because that is the drive of nature. And all the, then, the vision of the different departments of life is connected with the central vision of life which he has got. So that the development of society or science or education or poetry, arts, you see, everything is, is, is related to this central vision. And each finds a connection with the, with the central vision. Well, that makes the whole synthesis very rich and integral, I mean, magnificent in the way that no aspect of man's capacity is left out and no field of life is left out without any, any, any chance of reaching the highest possible you know, development uh, which can be envisaged now, I mean, for about 500 years, perhaps. <laughs> right. It is politics, it is economics, it is, uh, you know, poetry, it is arts, and it is philosophy, it is psychology, and, and uh, I don't know what it is not. <laughs> well, why would the state be represented as a uh, huh? fourfold uh, social order? What would mean? Why would the, why would the psychic be? Psychic being by in that four, uh, no, four psychic four. being is behind all. Psychic being, it is that takes the fourfold aspect, you see. Because that is nature. You must make a distinction between the nature and the being that manifests in nature. Purush and Prakriti, you see, the being and the becoming. Yeah. So the Purush is present in all as the divine spark or the root, so to say, the divine entity. And it is that which takes up for manifestation, a formation or a organization of nature, in which one part of nature might dominate, but uh, all the rest are necessary in order to give it, give it a full fulfillment or a full expression in life. 
There are things of what are we going to do with millions of law books and outmoded laws and lawyers trying to dig things up that was made five thousand years ago to serve their purpose. <laughs> well, <laughs> I agree with you with the, with the lawyers being out of place in a scheme of inner development, but lawyers will say there is an outer life where we hope or we believe or we think we serve a useful purpose. And, uh, so long as people have property and differences about property, I think lawyers will be there. Unless you liquidate property, which is not impossible. <laughs> Only one doesn't know what would take it. <laughs> it is conceivable, but uh, not easily practicable. <laughs> well, I think they should have, I think someday we're going to come to a limitation. We're going to chuck the old laws out that were made a hundred years ago, start over again, maybe laws with this age. That is what we are telling, that individual can begin to legislate for himself. That is the beginning. We can only begin with ourselves, you see. For these inner changes which are almost radical, the only starting point is the individual. And that is where his vision is absolutely, truly founded that no socialist philosophy has a right to crush the individual. That will kill the... The, the, the philosophy of social reconstruction itself. Individual is indispensable for the, the last brick of cosmic creation. He must be there. If you crush the individual, well, you lose the springs of action and springs of inspiration. So one begins with the individual because that is the sacred ground on which any great effort can be founded, you see. Ronnie, weren't you um, saying to us that the, now we've come to the end of the aggregate um, of getting as large as it can in the nation? I mean, yes, there are four time. lectures here, so don't be in a hurry. <laughs> what I wanted to ask was, what I wanted to ask was, it's just a preliminary report. <laughs> what I wanted to ask was, isn't, isn't it now as though the spiral of evolution is coming back on a higher level to the small group again now? Uh, yes, that now it will be on a higher level. Yes, group. yes. When the, when when a group, you see, when a new principle is embodied in evolution, as I was just telling you, the basic principle is that if it wants to become permanent, it must be embodied in a group. Mm -hmm. It's only a small group that begins. Yes, that and then true. that has a tendency to either start other groups mm -hmm. and then the coalition. They come together and form a big group afterwards. Mm -hmm. First, there are, you know, as he calls it, the islands of light. Mm -hmm. yeah. He puts it in light even in the last chapter, as islands of light. Mm -hmm. So that there is one island of light here, somewhere there, somewhere there, different forms, no dictation, no central motive, only the inner truths which you want to embody is one. You put aside the economy-centric outlook of collective life. That is first proposition with which you start, because if that is there, then nothing new can be created. So you start with this, a life in which the first priority is development of inner life. And those who join it have that priority, that they join the group, not for anything but for inner growth. Mm -hmm. And they live a life in which every action contributes to that aspiration, fulfillment of the aspiration of inner life. Mm -hmm. And when they have built up a small organization, well, the principle is trying more and more to get established. In some other country, similarly, people form a group, perhaps differently constituted outside, but with the same inspiration and same aspiration. So to, to live in a life and reach a, a, a condition of consciousness in which their individual self and their collective instinct will be fulfilled. Without imposition of economic the no force is as if they were the guiding, determinative, and dictating force. This is the modern melody of the age, and the, the remedy is only individual. He has to rise to that and refuse to admit the dominant of economic, economy-centric outlook of life and put idealism, maybe, maybe ethics, maybe higher value of art, maybe some aesthetic. Maybe some religious idea or spiritual idea, but something more than this money. Because it is man's creation and he is being ground by his own. It is terrific. It is rich, it is giving tremendous chance, it is a progress on one side. You see, it can release man. 
because now man need not work as he did before, quite. So that the potentiality for the good it holds is so immense. But unless it is downgraded and put in its proper place, we do not want economic disorganization. But we want economy to be relegated to its proper place in social organization. Economy in a collective life is indispensable today. You cannot do without economy. But the economy must be somewhere secondary to either intellectual idealism, moral idealism, ethics, or some principle, something. This is terrific. Collective life being ruled by, you know, economy-centric outlook by administrations of nations, it's a huge machine. It is terrific. It is something is so much against the very dignity of man that I don't know why they, how they put up with it. Seriously about this problem, they feel this, but they feel helpless before a vast machine. I told you in London, <coughs> some of the intellectuals actually agreed with the analysis which, which uh, Sri Aurobindo had given. And they said, well, we don't know where to lay our hands, where to begin. 24 hours round and it's going, 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 and where to put the hand now? And only individual is the answer. The only possible answer is the man, individual. He must. In whatever way he may feel. Yes, that's the only possible. Then something will come out of it. Because, as I told you, he will not be alone, remember. Mm -hmm. He will never be alone. That of which he speaks, the omnipresent reality is there. And it wants a point of support to drive its ways. And the individual must tend, he must become an instrument. You will never be unsupported. Mm -hmm. Try the women. Mm -hmm. Try the women. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's what she was all about. Yeah. Oh, this is the last thing was already done. Sorry. Sorry. There are 38 chapters, I think. Oh, no. More than 35, anyway. In the, in the human unity. But uh, we'll make a quick move. I mean, we'll take this summary because try to deal with them. And then there are four more expositions which I myself have given in the World Union there at Pondicherry, of which some portions I'd like to give. I spoke at the One World Union at Pondicherry. It was, uh, Jay Smith is working there in that. And he said that uh, I should give my study of the human cycle and life, I mean, ideal of human unity. So I had given three or four, and out of them I like to make a presentation so that we can sum up this subject afterwards in the light of modern conditions. We are going through this study because he has made a very detailed study of this whole international growth of man, so institutions and collectivities, collectivities and their institutions. It's a very, very profound study. Oh, it's a, it is a small book and therefore people may not know it, but it's a profound study of world history. It's not volume like that, mm -hmm. 10 volumes, but in that volume he holds the whole, whole uh, you know, the evolution of human history, institutions and collectivities. So the two, the very profound study, very profound. I made, I read uh, Toynbee, for instance, and mm. Toynbee had nothing new to tell me. Nor, in fact, I could tell two or three points to Toynbee. Yeah. When he lectured at Delhi, the first thing I found was he said it 40 years ago. The first thing I said was 40 years ago, somebody said that. What Toynbee spoke in Delhi as a lecturer, he was called by you know, the Maulana Azad lectureship, he was giving four or five lectures. I read them and I said, well, this Ramadan said 40 years ago, and he said many things more. His reading of history is that you see the religious impulse has to come back to man. You see, that is inspiration for collective life. 
Right. After visiting India, he changed his mind a little. And he said, it's not religious, but spiritual impulse. You see, it brought a change in his outlook. He came to Pondicherry. I met him personally also. He's a nice man. He was only for a few hours there. He's old now. In England, he had an idea that Roman Catholic would supply the needed drive for reconstitution of collective life, you see, on, on an on inner basis. When he came to India, he found that uh, that was not a correct idea in his mind. I mean, his conclusion was not right. He felt that uh, tolerance in India was far more in degree than he had ever imagined anywhere in the world. He, in fact, said so to me that uh, the, this one thing I find here is tolerance. He had thought that was the height of tolerance. He found this greater degree of tolerance in actual practice. And then he changed his mind in the sense that it is not any particular religion, but the religious impulse. And religious impulse in man is seeking for an experience. It's not seeking for formation of religious uh, credos. It's formation for seeking for a, for a concrete experience. So then his mind changed and he said that it is the it is some inner truth of man that he has to live. But that was he added afterwards, I think, in the seven articles, two or three articles, they wrote about how he has undergone a slight alteration in his reading human history. But it's a good study he has made because he has answered the position of Kostwa Spangler very well. Spangler has written two volumes on Decline of the West. So it's a very encyclopedic work and very detailed study also. And it wanted to establish one position for human history. And I think time we answered that position well.